Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Armando F. Sanchez. Thank you for here, being here in our production at the beautiful campus of California State University, San Bernardino. We have three wonderful guests. We're hoping for one more as well. But let me begin very quickly to highlight what the whole storyline will be today. The future. The future. We're not talking about 20, 30, 40 years from now. We're talking about the future as of today. Technology is changing everything as we speak. Even in our studio here today, we looked around and we all realized that six months ago, the systems were different. But the impact of technology is not only how we do things and how connectability we have, it's the impact on jobs and skills of people. So we're asking the question, what is the skills that students, whether it be high school, college, need to learn need to adapt, need to absorb in order to be prepared to succeed in the 21st century digital world. So we have several members coming in from different parts of Southern California who are here with us today. And part of us is live. Mr. Kurt Hahn here is in our studio with us, as well as we have two virtual guests. Uh, Mr. Zuniga, I can't say enough of great things about him. I saw him when, I met him when he was very, very young, much younger than he is today. Sorry about that, Felix. <laughs> but uh, uh, I met him when he was still an undergraduate here, and the idea was that he was one of the persons that could see the future, could talk about how digital world was going to impact us. And uh, he's been my mentor ever since. He's uh, one third my age, but he's 20 times more brilliant than I am. So, Felix Zunigas, <laughs> thank you for being here on the show with us. And we have, we have Robert Guzman. Now, Mr. Guzman, uh, he's going to introduce himself, but I've known him for many, many years. He's a, he's a major leader in East Los Angeles and the Southern California area for the engineering side as well as the IT side. I know he's very prominent in pushing the issue amongst also the Latino community of the importance of what impact uh, AI robotics is having in the world. Robert, thank you for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Katie. Well, gentlemen, I'm going to throw the question mm -hmm. out there right off the bat, and we're going to start. And we'll start with Felix. Felix, so he's the one that sort of brought the whole issue to us many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And here we are on the campus still discussing it. Uh, given your background that you are a director here on campus in AI and IT, I'm sorry. Felix, from uh, your generation, being that you're half my age, but your generation, the millenniums, what do you see? What does your group see in terms of the future and jobs and positions and what people have to learn in school in order to succeed? Well, first of all, Armando, thank you for um, putting the show together. And it is always an honor to participate in these productions. Um, when you ask the question, you know, what, what do we see? Uh, it, it's always a difficult question because it's always changing. It's always moving. Um, we are always dealing with new technology and um, trying to integrate the new with the old. And, and when I say the new with the old, uh, what we do with the university, you know, has been done for thousands of years, right? Teaching and learning. And uh, technology is constantly changing, changing every day. So it's a matter of how do we integrate uh, teaching and learning with technology in order to prepare our students for the careers that are going to be uh, they're going to be going to seek out there after they graduate at the university. So I always go back to the basics: um, problem solving, uh, listening skills, communication skills are going to be critical for our students. Uh, you know, we talked about that before with uh, liberal arts versus technical education. And you know what? What is more important? And I think it's now this hybrid or, or you know, a combined um, experience that they're going to be getting at the university. You know, it, it, when you say university, and you said about the history of education and all that, technically now, one professor can teach a subject to all the classrooms in the world if they all speak the same language. Well, now we have translators too. So even that's changing. So isn't it theoretically possible where you could have a handful of professors around the world, I'll say a thousand of them, and they could pretty much teach tens of thousands of classes and put professors out of business? 
Yeah, you know, when you look at what we're doing here as far as technology goes and, and being able to leverage high-speed internet and computers and cameras and technology, you know, with, with your mobile device, you know, you can uh, be connected instantly and communicate with people around the world. You're right. Um, I think when, when uh, technology reaches the point where, you know, we're able to simulate that classroom or person-to-person -person experience, um, you know, as long as we're not moving totally to actors instead of teachers, you know, uh, but the combination where, where those two things meet and keep people engaged in learning, you know, it is going to create a challenge for the traditional institution that we know as, as college or, or, you know, any other method of, of traditional learning. It's, 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 it's an impact. It's one we have to think about and be prepared for that. Sort of taking a different angle here, we're going to go over to Mr. Kurt Hans. He is CEO of S3 Productions. And I know that you're doing a lot of shows in terms of podcasting and webcasting. And, you know, you also teach technology in Southern California for uh, the secondary level. How do you see this question about how to, what skills are youth need to learn in order to succeed in the 21st century? Well, as Felix said, you, you know, I teach high school. I'm not even at the university level, so I have to bring it down even further. And when you're competing with the cell phone, the iPad, the laptop, video games, YouTube, et cetera, so forth and so on, how do you teach a kid with a short attention span even to listen to what I've got to try and teach him? Uh, all the soft skills, the problem solving, creative thinking, communications, um, how do you teach that when but assuming you can, how, how would you do it? Uh, I, that, that's a question I'm not sure if I even know how to answer. Um, because, like I say, you got to teach basic skills, and a lot of our kids, at least I've seen anecdotally, is that they're losing that what's required to do those skills because everything is on their instant gratification on their phone. And uh, so. So am I understanding correctly what you're sharing is the idea that the skills that are essential for the future, which you mentioned and Felix mentioned, is not necessarily something that's really being focused on? I don't think it is. I mean, personally, this is my own humble opinion, because how do you teach somebody who's engaged with their cell phone who doesn't care anything about it? i got to tell them, you know? Well, so the, 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 the experience of youth using their cell phones, et cetera, is not really preparing them for the future? I don't think so, personally. I mean, it's a great tool, but on the other hand, uh, you have to interact with people. And there's nothing more frustrating than walking into a restaurant or a fast food place, and the guy behind the counter is on his phone while you're trying to order a cheeseburger. <laughs> well, they you know. eliminated that person altogether now. Yeah, well, that's what McDonald's well, is doing. Well, what is it now? You don't, now they have kiosks, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um. Right before we go over to Robert Guzman, we have our other guest. He just arrived mm -hmm. in there, Manuel Franco. Manuel, join us in the studio. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here today. And my apologies for being late. And there's your... Oh, okay. Mom. Hi, Manuel. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> Traffic was good, a little good. crazy. Manuel Franco comes in right now from Los Angeles. He drove in and uh, he pushed and shoved his way out here. So thank you for being here. <laughs> so we're giving okay. Manuel a few seconds here to catch up. We're going to jump over to Robert Guzman. He's also our other virtual guest. Robert, you've been hearing the discussion back and forth. And I know, give us a setting what you work with and how your what your views into this discussion is all about. <clears throat> well, I, I, uh, I, I, I agree with both, uh, both our other colleagues because I, you know, I used to be a, 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 a trainer or a teacher at NASA. And so, you know, our, our training, uh, we were training some of the brightest people in the world how to use computers uh, at a time when computers were just barely coming in. And, of course, NASA was always the, the uh, place where manufacturers wanted to um, uh, put their products for testing because if it wasn't approved by us, it wasn't going to probably be commercially available, uh, you know, and so so we got to see a lot of the technology, maybe like five years ahead of what would eventually come out into the commercial world, and and then I also had the opportunity to teach uh, high school kids K through 12, and so the the 
the variation of learning, uh, and, and that was more around the computer era where they actually were desktops, you know? And today, your cell phone is a computer. It's uh, it literally can do many things that a basic computer would do. Uh, in fact, some of the young people probably say, computer? You know, because they're used to using their cell phones. Oh, that's right. We don't use the iPads. word anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. they go. So they don't even know what a computer is because, you know, the, these are these are more like the dinosaur equipment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the technology changes uh, almost every six months, and and so you know, to be prepared for the workforce, uh, you really have to be pushing the thread of what the new technology is about. And um, and I'm not seeing. I mean, out of the universities, as well. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of these kids are not even being prepared to go to university because, you know, a lot of their basic skills still lag. You know, the, the basic mathematics and the basic English skills are, 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 are essential for someone to go into a, a engineering science program. And so, so not having those strong uh, fundamentals makes it difficult and makes it much easier to drop out of pursuing these type of, uh, of careers into a different type of career, which which uh, requires less. And and so the, the key for, I think, uh, our future, uh, for our future companies is that if they don't have top talent coming out of our school, out of the uh, universities uh, in the United States, then, then our company is going to start to draw back uh, in, it, in its global competition, and we're going to see other companies forge ahead. And we've kind of been seeing that, you know, when when you think that we used to have a, a Xerox company, and uh, and and we used to have other companies, and and they've been surpassed by other companies for whatever reason. Their technologies got easier, and uh, and so we, you know, we don't see some of our American companies that used to be. Uh, the world leaders leading anymore. Let me and and uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Let me jump in on here because you brought up a very uh, exciting point here that uh, sort of excites a lot of ideas in me, and I want to sort of bring in Manuel into the discussion in this area. That okay, so we see the companies not being successful; they're not keeping up with the competition around the world. Uh, or we're seeing them reduce themselves. And I think Manuel and I have had this discussion even in your company, which Correct. is in the printing business. In the middle of all this discussion, we've got to bring in the question, what about the humans? What about either A, they're losing their jobs, the, the employees are losing their jobs, the workforce is being reduced, companies are actually producing more, and now we've got a new batch of students in the schools anxious to graduate and move on, and now we got a clash going on here between those that were in the workforce are now out of a job, and then we're feeding in a whole new group of youth. How do you see all this developing, Manuel? You know, there's a lot of areas that have been discussed. Uh, first, that automation's taking over jobs, and <clears throat> we're losing jobs. Then the other point that comes up is the fact that as a human race, we're always able to learn new things, change, and move forward. And that seems to be some of the things that we have to focus on and do. Um, again, new skills and the ability to change your skills what is what seems to be driving right now. Our company, you know, at one area we had a total of 30 people. It's down to six people to do the same process. And we're still accomplishing pretty much the same volume. What happened to those other 30 people? They went in looking for other types of jobs. Some of them have retrained. Others have gone down in their ability of work or income, but uh, they've had to you know, look at other ways of uh, completing their jobs. So there's new jobs that are gonna come out. But I guess the main thing, and it came up in, in what uh, Robert was uh, discussing, is the fact of how do we prepare our kids and uh, a lot of the basics is just to make sure that they have the ability to think, the ability to solve problems, to work with other people, and to be able to learn new tasks. Uh, apprenticeship is something that was a standard in our industry. That's gone. Well, apprenticeship for what? The jobs are now no longer there. 
Let's put somebody in the hot spot on this question. Okay. Uh, that I think is an excellent point. Uh, well, let's bring in uh, Felix Zuniga back again. And the reason we're going to bring mm -hmm. in Felix is because Felix is on this last stage of doing his doctorate degree. Right. So here he is, a person who in the uh, in the IT world, getting his doctorate in education. So, uh, Felix, what's your view and take on this? You know, um, I think it is inevitable. You know, I, I have a four-year-old son, and from the time he could reach over and grab my cell phone or mobile device or computer, you know, he goes up to the TV and he touches the screen to see how he can interact with the TV now because everything in his life, in his life has always been mobile ready and, and he can touch and move things like that. So to him, that's old technology when it doesn't respond. Um, and then you introduce kids into formal education, public education, and you know, we go back to, to what we call you know, the basics and we're not necessarily integrating technology at all times there. So I think there's gonna be a fine mix of having to produce those, those skills, those uh, life skills as well as new skills like we talked about with uh, communication, but the ability to learn how to learn. Um, I think that's a key skill that, that students need to be able to acquire because, you know, in technology, by the time you've learned it in a classroom, it's already, it's already passed. It, you know, <laughs> you may understand yeah. the basics of what was there before, but you need to be ready to solve the problems that haven't been invented yet. So it's, it's kind of integrating what they already know, you know, students are, are kids are, are digital natives, right? They've been born with technology in their hands. Uh, I saw or heard a study recently about, you know, when, when parents remove um, like a cell phone or a mobile device, it causes security issues for kids because <laughs> it's, been, it's been the thing that is stable for them. And so they're talking about the, the psychology behind what happens uh, from limiting them. So I'm, I'm thinking back to Kurt's question about in the classroom, what kind of policy do we have with you know, digital devices while they're in the classroom. And there may be some other kind of psychological, you know, security things that are going on with them that are causing them not to engage and learn because they're freaking out on the back end. You know, instead of using tools like, uh, there's a tool called Kahoot, where you can uh, ask questions and the students answer on their on their mobile phones and, and they, they're engaged. And if you build it into your pedagogy of how you teach the class, uh, and have it interactive, you can turn it into, you know, there's there's this concept called gamification of education, you know, where you, kids are used to doing something and getting rewarded uh, digitally for that, you know, earning bad, um, integrating what's, what's working and what's working out there as far as games. Everybody's been hooked on some little cell phone mobile game or they love video games and, and bring that into education and, and utilize it and utilize it to help them engage. Boy. I just hope my surgeon doesn't go into some uh, surgical game and try it before he figures out how to do operation <laughs> on me. We you have know, I, I got a question that comes up when you're talking about that. If the, if the phone is their security, is it actually starting to replace the parent? Ouch. Could be. Both parents are typically working. Exactly. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, exactly. So and we have a we can in here in San Bernardino on the campus we can create a virtual parent over there and then yeah. have the virtual parent <laughs> be the new. Oh, this is all this is getting scary, guys. Is well, exactly, there, exactly. Oh, yeah. When you stop and think that first, there's a lot of automated um, call-ins areas where you can put your medical condition, and it automatically tells you what the probabilities are. Same thing with legal advice. There's automated legal advices. So what is it going to catch, you know, could we set up an automated parent? Robert? <laughs> what do you scary. think? scary. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. Well, you know, I, I think uh, as, as, we, uh, <clears throat> as we're seeing the, uh, the age of the baby boomers uh, retiring in a massive number, uh, <laughs> which are, are kind of the leading uh, runners of our corporations, uh, in either the board of director positions or the most technical people, uh, a lot of uh, void uh, spaces is, is being created because this is happening in a very short window within about a 10 year span. And so when you think, uh, uh, how does that impact, uh, you know, us in the United States? Well, we have what, 300, uh, maybe about 310 million people and our top workforce, 75 million are retiring so fast that we, we're literally trying to 
throw people into the workforce with very low skills. And, and obviously, uh, <clears throat> the automation has caused some of some of those job losses. But there's 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 retraining that has to happen uh, in, in, in a very fast way. And and I, and I think part of the problem that uh, we're seeing is that the pipeline from uh, high school. Well, first of all, it starts actually at the grammar grammar school because a lot of these kids don't believe they can go into math and science. Yeah. Uh, so so we're already losing them just because of that because television never portrays you Third know uh, uh, <laughs> you know a, a Hispanic you know emerging in corporate America in some kind of technical capacity, right? So 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 as we're losing these kids. Uh, giving up on, on uh, science, mathematics, engineering, and technology, then, then when they go to the, uh, in the high schools, they're, they're already not seeing themselves moving that direction. Now, yes, with the advent of these smartphones and all this, it's, it's creating a, a whole new type of person. But the problem uh, that was addressed about uh, problem solving isn't there. Uh, because, you know, in, in a job, you have to be able to rely on other people and work as a team. And, and so when you isolate yourself and you're not used to communicating, uh, that becomes a problem. It becomes a problem in, uh, that, you, that uh, is going to be introduced in a corporation that isn't going to solve problems. It's, you know, because everybody's independent of each other. And, and so, you know, I always learned uh, that, that because I was always active in college, that by being uh, with other people, not, I not being the smartest one, but you know, having a lot of other people around you, we can somehow, using more, you know, other brains, eventually solve problems. And and so, it it helped me become a better student because I could at least understand and solve problems through that mechanism. But I lot I saw a lot of students uh, that did go to college. And these are mentioned. These are our elite students coming out of. A community that we normally lose a lot of these kids in high school. You know, at least back then, we were losing at least 50% out of dropout. Wow. So you think, well, 50% go on, you know, at least get a high school uh, degree, right? But of the 50% that did, only 15% would go on to college. You know, um, the rest would just go on and get jobs, and, and well, that's great. But, you know, the job market isn't going to pay you enough when you do that. To, yeah, to the, have a house, and medical, and all that. Yeah, the, the the whole aspect that the the income of the future is actually reducing itself, with the middle class is reducing itself. Unfortunately, we're running out of time on this show, and again, we have two virtual guests and three of us on here. I do want to plug in one thing that the connection that Manuel and I have had for many many years that we're both Salesians. We right. went through the technical schools, and you know, which offered us both sides. And uh, we're still asking that question even today. As we're getting ready to close the show, I'm going to give everybody two minutes uh, to go out and uh, close the show and give us your thoughts. And uh, let's start with Felix. Felix, because Felix, I, I think, is uh, the more of the future. He's the young kid on the block, but more <laughs> the idea that he's getting his PhD in education uh, in IT. I think it sets a sort of mood for all of us to uh, look at and analyze. So. Let's go to Felix. Felix, uh, wherever you out there in the virtual world, your closing yeah. statements. Yeah, so, so you know, because of tools like this, it allows me to be anywhere in the world and you know, participate with, with this uh, program. So I, I just want to leave you with the thought that if it's something that's a repetitive type of job, it's going to be automated, right? It's already happening now. Um, you talked about McDonald's. Uh, UPS, Amazon, they're all investing in, in the robotics. They're a part of their, their everyday life. Uh, out, if you look at the Port of LA or Port of Long Beach, you know, they have the big ship containers that come in and get unloaded automatically now. So the longshoreman job is, is, is disappearing. Um, blue collar, you know, it'll still be there for a while. We're, this, we're in this time where it's shifting from manual labor to automated labor. Uh, I think projections show by 2030 is when we're going to have more robots and, and automation doing those jobs. So if it's repetitive, it's going to disappear. Um, you know, I, I recently did a job interview with a, a, a person who was looking for like an entry level job. 
and she interviewed perfectly on this medium of a digital interview. Uh, and when we went to that second round on campus in person, it was different. Um, and I think it was because she wasn't used to interacting with people in the same way. And, and we talked about, about that. And so it was, it was definitely interesting to see how that's playing forward. Um, but we also have to remember, this is the world that they're inheriting and pretty soon the millennials are gonna be the ones running everything. You know, so it's it's going to be shaped around what their wants and needs are. You know, um, you mentioned the baby boomers and and that generation moving out of the leadership role. So what happens when you have a millennial? Role? Um, does that mean that it, it's you know get with it or get out? I mean, I, what's going to happen there? Uh, that's <laughs> the new question popped up for me. I'm retired. I'm retired. I don't <laughs> have to get pushed out. <laughs> Thank you, Felix. Uh, Robert, you got a minute? Your closing statements? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think Felix brought up a good point, and that is the interaction between millennials and, and the other uh, generations because uh, uh, they all work differently. Uh, they communicate differently. And, and so in order for a company to succeed, um, they have to figure out how to make all these uh, uh, generations communicate properly uh, in their workforce uh, to be competitive. And, and I think that's going to be something that uh, needs to be dealt with, uh, you know, within the universities is, is how, how do they prepare their students to, to integrate with variation of, of uh, generations because nobody really think has the answer for that. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, that does create problems in the workforce. Um, uh, you know, the, the the venue that I come from is that I, I work with companies. And so we're trying to always find people that will, can work in our environment. And, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, there are many more job day. I think the job uh, unemployment is about 4%. But the question is, you know, uh, <clears throat> why, why do people still struggle financially, you know, with 4% unemployment. And that's because the jobs aren't paying as well, uh, at least the lower tier jobs. Right. And so you almost have to have two jobs in order to make it in wow. today's economy. Thank you very much, Robert Guzman, who are coming in from Southern California with us. And now I'm gonna throw it to Kurt Hahn. Well, as a baby boomer who is getting ready to retire, who also teaches high school, um, you know, it's, it's scary because these are the kids who are going to take care of my future. Ooh, I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an example. Just to, uh, <laughs> the local hardware store in my hometown, in my city is going out of business. What's killing them is automation, technology. Everybody can buy the stuff they need off Amazon. What they're going out of business is because they can't survive on the guy who comes in and goes, I need that part, and how do I do that? Because you go to Home Depot, they can't help you. Amazon can't help you. You know, everything is so automated that you can't talk to that person to say, okay, now that I got this part, how do I make it work? Whether it's to fix your sink, your plumbing, paint the house, or whatever. And for us old guys that are retiring, who's going to help me when I need that question answered? You know? Um, and I thought you were going to have an answer, and you led me up with a question. Now I'm more confused. <laughs> well, I try to explain this to a high school kid with the technology is changing every six months. Uh, we talk about buying a car, and I'll keep this very short. Kid says, why do I need to buy a car? I can order it online, and there it shows up on the front doorstep. And I go, no, that doesn't happen. Well, I saw the ad on TV where you can do that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Uh, a young person uh, in middle school can order a U an Uber to take them home yeah, with yeah. permission of the parents. And uh, so why should why to wait to drive? You know, it goes back to the kid making ten bucks an hour who wants to buy the eighty thousand dollar Ferrari. Okay. Yeah, it's a different generation. Mr. Manuel Franco, your thoughts? You know, it's a lot. The world keeps on changing. The challenge is that that change right now is going at such a strong and exponential mm -hmm. speed that it's becoming more and more challenging. The good part is that humanity adapts. 
But that's what we're talking about right now. Mm. How do we set the, the youth coming up to adapt and understand that they have to adapt quickly? Critical thinking continues to be a very important part. Problem solving, incredibly important. And then also, which has been a bigger cha challenge, is being able to work with everybody around them, not just the computer, which seems to be right now that go-to piece is the smartphone, the, 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 the unit that you have in your hand. And that's a challenge that we have to learn so that we can communicate on a one-to-one -one basis. And a lot of the things that have come around is the fact that the individual is still extremely important, but family also comes in because that's the area of being able to communicate and relate and work and understand, not only on future but past, uh, and have a support system. And the last one, naturally, is the spirituality side of it, which I didn't hear us discuss it at all. But that's also a very important part. And in one of our talks that we had uh, with Manuel, the uh, psychologist, that was the point that he, you know, had come, come out in his studies, individual, family, and spirituality. So those are the things that I think we need to continue studying, looking, and promoting to our youth to be able to move forward and adapt as quickly as we can. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Um, quick disclaimer, we're going to do future shows and panels. We need to have women on the panel. Absolutely. You know, we want to see their perspective as well. They're being impacted, you know, equally in, in many different ways also. We need to have women on our panel. So, ladies, please join us. Um, second of all, I want to thank everyone here again at California State University San Bernardino for putting this virtual conference together where we have guests from a virtual world as well as here in the studio as well. I uh, want to thank Dora. I want to thank James. I want to thank everyone here who is behind the camera, who's behind the office, is helping us put this together. I have a problem with the discussion we had today, and I guess that's part of it all today. And you know, the, it's not a, a anyone, anyone's <coughs> problem, if you will, but this is the problem I hear. People say, well, we have to retrain people. Number one, retraining may take two, three years. How are they supposed to live in the meantime if they don't have a job and they're retraining? Number two, they're supposed to learn certain skills. Well, yeah, we sort of generalized that, you know, change. How do you implement that into the classroom? Three, when we say, okay, these jobs, they need to adapt from new jobs, but they're adapting to jobs that may not be there when they get there. So that is a discussion we didn't even touch. Right. We mentioned it. For jobs we don't even know about yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, somebody <laughs> said, yeah, I read that. It says, prepare for jobs that aren't even here yet. Well, you got to scratch your head on that and, one. And the second part of that quote is with the technology we don't even know exists yet. Well, that really solves a lot of issues, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to surface these questions. I don't think we're walking away with answers, but we're starting to start more dialogue about it, and this is what's something that I think we must continue to do and continue to investigate with people worldwide as they're seeing it because we could see it here from Southern California, but somebody who is in you know, the Philippines is looking at it a whole different way. And I'll close with this. One thing we did not mention, that the population of India and China is eight times larger than the population of the United States. And, and we're competing Canada, with Mexico them combined. as well. And then we have Mexico and all the other places. We haven't even begun to touch that iceberg unto itself and how that's impacting our jobs when they're willing to work for a third of the pay that they make here in the United States. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the beginning, not the end of the discussion. Thank you for being here with us again. I'm Armando F. Sanchez. I want to thank our guests today, Felix Sunigas, Robert Guzman, Mr. Kurt Hahn. Thank you. Manuel Franco. <laughs> He's the one who got us into this mess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Armando F. Sanchez. Please contact me at lsacnational at hotmail.com if you have any questions about our program. Love to hear from you. And we'll see you on our next program. So think of all those questions. Let's get them out there. Let's start talking and finding solutions. Thank you for being with us. Adios. Thank you. Thank you.